Hello everyone and welcome to the Unanswered Questions True Crime Podcast. I have spent hours and hours investigating this. He basically told her that people have been killed. Journalists, independent investigators, people like that disappeared. It frightened her to the bone. There's more to the story than meets the eye. There were rumors of torture and homicide and sexual abuse, all sorts of egregious, horrendous crimes. He was polygraphed three times. Each of those three showed evasions. His resumes were a skeleton of truth. He was mad at the world, and particularly mad at the government. The study that he commissioned that described a fictional terrorist attack. If people have died over this, it means you're getting close to the truth. You don't have to be a conspiracy theorist to say, what the fuck? Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of my new podcast, Unanswered Questions, where every week we will endeavor to discuss a mysterious unsolved case that has many lingering unanswered questions. So I hope you enjoy, and as always, leave me some feedback on what you think about the show and rate it as well. Now on to the show. This week, we'll be talking about the Clinton body count conspiracy theory. Now, the Clinton body count is a conspiracy theory that asserts former U.S. President Bill Clinton and his wife, former U.S. Secretary of State Hillary Clinton, have secretly had their political opponents murdered, totaling as many as 50 or more. Such allegations have been circulated since at least 1994, when a film called The Clinton Chronicles, produced by Larry Nichols, who's featured in this list, and promoted by Rev. Jerry Falwell, accused Bill Clinton of multiple crimes, including murder. Additional promulgators of the conspiracy include Newsmax publisher Christopher Ruddy, Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene, and others. Several sources have discredited the conspiracy theory, such as Congressional Record, the Lakeland Ledger, the Chicago Tribune, Snopes website, and others, pointing to detailed death records, the unusually large circle of associates that a president is likely to have, and the fact that many of the people listed have been misidentified or were still alive. Others had no known link to the Clintons. Now we get into the history of this so-called list. The Congressional Record 1994 condemns the list while citing an article in New U.S. News and World Report, August 8th of 1994, by Greg Ferguson and David Bomeister, quote, whatever it is, Bill Clinton likely did it, end quote. It was determined that the original list titled Clinton Body Count, Coincidence or the Kiss of Death was compiled by lawyer and activist Linda Thompson. The report concluded, quote, Thompson admits that she has no direct evidence of Clinton killing anyone. Indeed, she says the deaths were probably caused by people trying to control the president, but refuses to say who they were, end quote. Now we get into this alleged list of victims of the Clinton body count, which I tend to think that the Clinton body count actually does exist and is real, just because of the amount of people that died that were either close to the Clintons, had something on the Clintons, or knew something about the Clintons that was damaging and detrimental to them. So here's the list. First off, we start with Susan Coleman. She had an affair with Clinton when he was Attorney General of Arkansas. She died February 15th of 1977. She died of suicide with gun shot wound to the back of her head, no autopsy allowed, was seven months pregnant at the time of her death. She told friends it was Bill Clinton's child. She was 26 at the time of her death. Then we have Don Adams, who died on the 7th of January of 1997. Long before Whitewater's land flips made the Clinton circle of friends rich, many of the same players had been involved in a similar land swindle in Branson. Don Adams was a lawyer in Arkansas who got involved trying to help people who were being swindled out of their life savings. Then we have John Ashey, former United Nations General Assembly President. He died June 22nd of 2016. Initially reported as having died from a heart attack, John's throat had obviously been crushed. At that point, the official story changed to him accidentally dropping a barbell on his own throat. The plot line from the episode An Exercise in Fatality from the TV series Columbo crushing his larynx. As she was about to begin trial for a bribery charge involving Chinese businessman Ning Lap Sing, who had been implicated but not charged in the 1996 Chinagate scandal for funding illegal donations to Bill Clinton's re-election fund through our Kansas restaurant owner Charlie Tree, as she was supposed to testify about Hillary's links to Ning Lap Sing later the same day he died. Then we have Robert Bates, Barry Seal's aircraft mechanic at Mina. He died on March 29th of 1995. Robert Bates supposedly died of an overdose of mouthwash, regarded by local authorities as an obvious homicide. 
Then we have Gandhi Albar, attorney representing Mr. Lassiter in a case concerning alleged financial misconduct, died on January 8th of 1994, died in an alleged suicide by jumping out of a window of a multi-story building. Mr. Lassiter was a close associate of Governor Clinton and was later indicted on drug-related charges, amongst other things. Bowles' law partner was suicided one month later on February 9th of 1994. Then we have Admiral Jeremy Border, Chief of Naval Operations, died May 16th of 1996. Border supposedly went home for lunch and decided to shoot himself in the chest twice using two guns rather than be interviewed by Newsweek magazine that afternoon. Explanations for Border's suicide focused on a claim that he was embarrassed over two valor pins he was not authorized to wear. Former CNO Admiral Elmo Zumwalt, sorry if I get that name wrong, said on the May 17th Larry King Live show that Admiral Border was not only authorized to wear the V on his medals, but they had personally authorized him to do so when he was serving as commander in naval forces Vietnam. When it turned out that Border was entitled to those decorations, blame shifted to stresses over the downsizing of the Navy and even Washington Times, the adverse effect the feminism was having on the Navy's morale. Border supposedly left two suicide notes, neither of which was released. On Thursday, June 25th of 1998, Navy Secretary John Dalton formally acknowledged that Border had been entitled to wear the decorations. So, like Brown and like Foster, the proximate cause for the suicide turns out to be fraudulent. Then we come to Ron Brown, former chairman, DNC Commerce Secretary, died May 3rd of 1996. Ron Brown died along with 39 other people when the T-43, a converted 737 used by the Air Force, carrying the group on a trip to Bosnia, crashed while approaching the Dubrovnik Airport. Sorry, I forget that name wrong. On the verge of being indicted and having stated publicly his willingness to make a deal with prosecutors, Ron Brown's death brought to an end his ability to testify. The very next day, Ron Brown's personal lawyer was murdered in a drive-by shooting. A few days later, the air traffic controller who'd been in charge during the aircraft crash was found dead and declared a suicide. On leaving Ron Brown's funeral, President Bill Clinton was seen laughing and joking until he saw the camera, then he went into his sad act. Then we come to James Bunch, influential Texan. Exact date of death is unknown. He died from a gunshot suicide similar to Vince Foster, was discovered to have a little black book containing the names of many influential persons in Texas and Arkansas who visited certain prostitutes. Then we have Eric Butera, who was a witness and died on December 4th of 1997. He was an informant who came forward offering money regarding the murder of White House intern Mary Mahoney. He was then sent into a known crack house to make an undercover buy for the police and was beaten to death. His mother was awarded $100 million in compensation, but a federal judge later slashed it to just $1 million. Then we have Katino Kamani, witness to a shooting near the White House, died on November 11th of 1994, suffered an unknown infection just before he was to testify, death attributed to apparent food poisoning. Then we come to the well-known case of Danny Casolaro, who's a journalist. He died on August 10th of 1991. Casolaro had been working on a project he called The Octopus. Casolaro had started his investigation over the Justice Department's theft of a software package called Promise from a company called Inslaw. Promise stood for Prosecutor's Management Information System, and it was a law enforcement database system that included a feature unique for the time. This was a module that could be programmed to automatically access other databases in order to present to the user a single picture of financial financial transactions or suspects from multiple sources. This made it a powerful spying tool and the US modified their version to include a backdoor, then made gifts of the software to other governments. All this was happening at the same time as the CIA's clandestine gun and gun running operation to supply the Nicaraguan Contras with untraceable weapons, a totally illegal operation which violated the Boland Amendment and the Logan Act. The US end of the smuggling pipeline was located in Mena, Arkansas, under the protection of then Governor Bill Clinton. The arming of the Contras was funded by smuggling vast quantities of cocaine into the US, a violation of drug laws, and then laundered through various banks, land flips, and an estate agency, the Arkansas Development Finance Authority created by Webster Hubble and signed into law by Bill Clinton, or in other words, ADFA. ADFA. The shoot-down of one of the planes by the Nicaragua and the capture of CIA asset Eugene Hassenfuss blew the cover off the operation and it became known as the Iran-Contra affair. During the congressional hearings into the scandal, attention was focused on the gun running and all mention of the CIA's cocaine flowing into the US was kept from the public eye by the committee chairman, Hawaii's Senator Daniel Inuin, a fixture in Hawaii going back to the CIA's smuggling of heroin from Vietnam back to the US. 
sorry if I get that name wrong, Casalero apparently stumbled over the existence of a vast network of government operatives and politicians, all linked together by the vast wealth acquired from the selling of CIA cocaine in the US, and was working on a book exposing the government-sanctioned drug running. When he was found in a bathtub in a hotel room, his wrists both deeply slashed in a manner that the pathologist declared did not appear to have been done by Danny himself. In particular of note was the deep cuts severed the tendons of the fingers, which would have made it impossible for Danny to slash his other wrist with the now useless hand. Despite this, the official verdict was suicide, although none of Danny's friends and families or I believe that, especially those who had been direct witnesses to the many death threats he had received. When found, the large accordion file of the notes of his new book had disappeared from his hotel room, as well as there were no fingerprints whatsoever in his hotel room. Then we come to the next victim, which was Berta Carres, human rights activist, died March 3rd of 2016. Killed while sleeping in her home in La Esperanza, Honduras, Berta Carreras had named Hillary Clinton as responsible for the Honduran coup, which toppled democratically elected President Manuel Zayla. Since the coup, Honduras has become one of the most violent places in the world. Growing awareness of Hillary's role in Honduras became a serious liability during Hillary's 2016 presidential campaign. Then we come to William Colby, who was Director of Central Intelligence, retired. He died April 27th of 1996. William Colby had been the DCI from 1973 to 1976 under Nixon and Ford. At age 76, Colby had found a new career and had just started writing for strategic investment at the time of his death. This had worried many insiders in the intelligence community who felt that Colby had already divulged too many of the CIA's secrets in the preceding years. Indeed, his dismissal by Ford because of his over-cooperation with congressional investigations into CIA wrongdoing. It was Colby who had revealed to Congress the plans to kill Fidel Castro, the spying on American citizens in direct violation of the CIA charter and the conducting of biological tests by the CIA on unsuspecting citizens or MKUltra for more clarity, George Bush replaced him. According to the original CNN report, Colby was reported missing by neighbours who recovered his canoe by one story from under the dock at Colby's house by another report a quarter one fourth of a mile downstream from Colby's home. Colby was, by all reports, a methodical, tidy man, yet police found his home unlocked, his computer on, and a partially eaten dinner on the table. The official story is that Colby had just put down his fork and decided to drop everything and go canoeing. Colby, at 76, was still a world traveller and consultant to many corporations. He recently became an editor of an important financial newsletter, Strategic Investment, which covered the Vince Foster suicide in detail. Its editors hired three renowned handwriting experts to investigate Foster's suicide note, which hadn't been found when his briefcase was first searched, but later materialised, torn into pieces with no fingerprints on any of the pieces. Upon comparing the document with others of Foster's writing, these experts declared it was a forgery and not a very good one at that. Colby had old enemies as well as new with plenty of motives for his extermination. He was in charge of the infamous Operation Phoenix during the Vietnam War in which more than 20,000 South Vietnamese citizens, supposedly Viet Cong sympathizers, were rounded up, tortured and executed. In the 1970s, he opened some of the secrets of the CIA to Congress. Quote, Colby insisted on going public about the agency's role in tapping the telephones and opening the mail of Americans, plotting the assassination of Fidel Castro and using human guinea pigs for mind control experiments involved involving LSD, aka MKUltra, the Times reports, end quote. On Monday, May 6th, Colby's body was found just 20 yards from where his canoe had been recovered, in an area that had been thoroughly searched several times by helicopters and search teams. Most notable about the body was the absence of a life jacket, which according to his wife, Colby always wore on the water. As has since been proven to have happened with the JFK Jr. case, false stories were being deliberately planted in the media, including one quoting Mrs. Colby herself as having been told by William Colby by phone that he was going canoeing. Mrs. Colby denied any such story. The week that he died, Colby was scheduled to meet with the Disclosure Project. Then we come to L.J. Davis, reporter investigating Clinton's scandals, attacked at his hotel room in Little Rock, and his notes were stolen. Then we have David Dry. He died the 8th of 1999. And I'm going to butcher this name. Pat Matriscania, owner of Jeremiah Films, which produces such videos as the Clinton Chronicles, and David Dreyer planned a trip to Washington, D.C. by private plane. At the last second, Pat had to cancel and David left without him, dying when the plane crashed. 
Then we have Daniel A. Dutko, C. Chairman of Leadership 2000. He died 27th of July 1999. Daniel A. Dutko, 54, was the co-chairman of Leadership 2000, the Democratic National Committee's main fundraising effort. He held many other high-level political positions, including Vice Chairman of Finance for Clinton and Gore in 1995, Finance Chairman of the 53 Inaugural Ball, and Vice Chairman of Finance for the DNC in 1996, when the Chinese money poured in. Attributed to a bicycle accident in which it's claimed he struck a hit on the concrete twice. Then we have the five Navy aviators, Clinton's bodyguards and escorts, died March 26th of 1993. Names not mentioned, but they all died in a crash of an E2C Hawkeye in Italy. The crash occurred shortly after the plane was waved off from a landing attempt on the carrier Roosevelt due to a foul deck. All five men had been Clinton's escorts during Clinton's visit to the Roosevelt two weeks prior. Three other men who'd flown Clinton to the Roosevelt for that visit also died in a helicopter crash. Then we have Herschel Friday, attorney and Clinton fundraiser, died on March 1st of 1994, killed when his plane exploded. The cause is unknown. Then we come to one of the most well-known of the Clinton body count victims, which was Vince Foster. He was the Deputy White House Counsel, died July 20th of 1993. Deputy White House Counsel Vince Foster was found dead in Fort Mercury Park off the George Washington Parkway in Virginia, outside Washington, D.C., on July 20th of 1993. His death was ruled a suicide by five official investigations. Park police discovered Foster dead from an apparently self-inflicted gunshot wound in the Fort Mastery Park off the George Washington Parkway in Virginia on July 20th of 1993. Foster was holding a gun in his hand. An autopsy and subsequent investigation later confirmed that Foster had died by shooting himself once in the mouth with a 38 caliber Colt revolver found at the scene. Subsequent investigations found that Foster was distraught over accusations and criticisms related to the White House travel office controversy. Foster had confided to his friends and colleagues that he was considering resignation but feared that he could not handle the personal humiliation of returning to Arkansas in defeat. Now, Foster admitted to his sister that he was depressed shortly before his death and he sought treatment for depression one day before committing suicide. Although police found no evidence of foul play, several tabloids and newsletters speculated that Foster's death may have been a homicide, possibly involving the Clintons themselves. Subsequent investigations by Special Prosecutor Robert Fisk and the Senate Banking Committee concluded that there was no evidence of a homicide. A final investigation led by Special Prosecutor Kenneth Starr also concluded that there was no evidence to support the claim that Foster was murdered. Starr's report addressed several additional questions about physical and forensic evidence that had previously fueled speculation about the case. The report established that Foster owned the handgun used in the suicide and confirmed that the body had not been moved from its position prior to its discovery by police. Police. The report concluded, in some based on all the available evidence, which is considerable, the OIC, Office of Independent Counsel, agrees with the conclusion reached by every official entity that has examined the issue, Mr. Foster committed suicide by gunshot in Fort Mastery Park on July 20th of 1993, end quote. The suicide was nevertheless continued to fuel speculation. Then-presidential candidate Donald Trump made news in 2016 when he remarked in an interview with the Washington Post that Foster's death was very fishy and added, and I quote, I will say that there are people who continue to bring it up because they think it was absolutely a murder. I don't do that because I don't think it's fair, end quote. Now we get into the evidence. Here is a text of Foster's resignation letter. Quote, I made mistakes from ignorance, inexperience, and overwork. I did not knowingly violate any law or standard of conduct. No one in the White House, to my knowledge, violated any law or standard of conduct, including any action in the travel office. There is no intent to benefit any individual or specific group. The FBI lied in their report to the AG. The press is covering up the illegal benefits they received from the travel staff. The GOP has lied and misrepresented its knowledge and role and covered up a prior investigation. The Usher's office plotted to have of excessive costs incurred, taking advantage of Kaki and HRC. The public will never believe the innocence of the Clintons and their loyal staff. The WSJ editors lie without consequence. I was not meant for the job or the spotlight of public life in Washington. Here, ruining people was considered sport. End quote. 
A draft of a resignation letter was found torn into 27 pieces in a briefcase after his death. Associate White House Counsel Steve Newrith discovered the torn pieces of the note in Foster's briefcase on July 26th. After receiving the note from Newith, White House Counsel Bernard Nussbaum handled the note various times before giving it to Park Police Lieutenant Joseph Megby the following evening. The United States Department of Justice, or DOJ, revealed the note's contents at a joint press conference with the Park Police on August 10th. The DOJ stated that a smudged palm print was on the note, but no fingerprints they confirmed the handwriting as Foster's. Independent counsel Robert Ray's report regarding the Whitewater controversy stated, The FBI laboratory performed a 1995 fingerprint examination of the note and identified Nussbaum's palm print on it. Three handwriting experts stated that the note was a forgery, with Oxford University manuscript expert Reginald Alton stating that the forgery was done by a moderate forger, not necessarily a pro, somebody who could forge a check. End quote. However, the final report stated that three separate handwriting analyses of the note by the Capitol Police and the FBI determined that the handwriting on the note was Foster's. Now we get into many conspiracy theories about the case. To start off with, we have the Arkansas Project. On May 2nd of 1999, the Washington Post published new details on the pursuit of a Foster conspiracy in an article by David Brock, a key figure in the Troopergate and Whitewater scandals whose disillusionment with the political corruption, motivating what would become known as the Arkansas Project, ended his lifelong commitment to the conservative movement and facilitated public dissemination of insider details on GOP machinations. The article explains how Brock was summoned to a meeting with Rex Armistead in Miami, Florida at an airport hotel. Brock claims that Armistead laid out for him an elaborate Vince Foster murder scenario, a scenario that he found implausible. Then we have the Clinton Chronicles, a political firestorm. In 1997, crime reporter Dan Muldeer was approached by Reginary Publishing House, a conservative group whose leadership was impressed by Muldeer's published works to publish a book on the Foster case. In researching Foster's death, Muldeer found that documents relating to the Whitewater Corporation were removed from Foster's office on July 22nd and sent to the Clinton's personal attorney and that the most oft-used conspiracy scenario could be traced back to Park Police Major Robert Hines who shared the idea with Reed Irvine, Accuracy in Media, and Christopher Ruddy, New York Post. Muldeer concludes, and Major Hines publicly maintains, that Hines incorrectly told Irvine and Ruddy that there is no exit wound in Foster's head. I don't think there was anything nefarious here. He was being approached by reporters and he wanted something to say. End quote. Still, the missing exit wound claim continued to surface. Maldia's research sought, amongst other things, to discover the origins of this line of investigation into the Clintons' credibility. In an interview for Saloon.com, he suggests that Foster had some blonde hair and carpet fibres on his suit jacket and he had semen in his underwear. So the Jerry Falwells and the right-wing crowd get a hold of this information and they start making movies alleging that the Clintons were involved in this murder. End quote. In 1994, Falwell subsidized the creation of a film called The Clinton Chronicles that featured Ruddy's claims that the gun that killed Foster was placed in his hand after the fact and that Foster's body was laid out to give the appearance of suicide, among others. Funding for the film was provided by Citizens for Honest Honest Government, an organization to which Falwell gave $200,000 in 1994 and 1995. Citizens for Honest Government covertly paid individuals who had provided information to media outlets such as the Wall Street Journal, Editorial Page, and the American Spectator magazine, and in 1995 made discretionary payments to two Arkansas state troopers who had spoken out in support of the idea of a conspiracy surrounding Foster's death. The two troopers, Roger Perry and Larry Patterson, had also previously given testimony supporting Paula Jones' claims of sexual misconduct and misuse of government resources against Bill Clinton as an allied troopergate. Then we have Eldo Friscona, Secret Service Agent, Captain Kevin Ernest, Aircraft Commander Captain Kimberly, Joe Wellhover, Pilot, 2 Lieutenant Benjamin T. Hall, Navigator SS Sergeant Michael J. Smith Jr., Loadmaster Sir M. and Rick L. Merritt, Flight Engineer SS Sergeant Michael R. York, Loadmaster Senior M. and Billy R. Ogston, and Crew Chief M. and Thomas S. Stephen, who all died August 18th of 1996, killed when the C-130 carrying the presidential limos crashed near Jackson Hole, Wyoming. All nine people on board a White House support plane were killed 
killed late Saturday, 10.48 p.m. MDT, when it crashed into Sheep Mountain, also known as Sleeping Indian Mountain, near Jackson Hole, Wyoming. The aircraft was en route from Jackson Hole to John F. Kennedy International Airport. The Air Force Lockheed Martin C-130 Hercules transport aircraft was carrying a presidential vehicle and many pieces of luggage, all related to the president's vacation, 50th birthday celebration in the Grand Tetons. President Clinton said Sunday afternoon that he was told the pilot was attempting to return to the Jackson Hole Airport when it crashed, in the CNN News report. The Air Force report finding no evidence of an in-flight mechanical emergency after examining the flight data and flight recorders and could not find evidence of the pilot radio mechanical trouble before crashing into the mountainside as reported by the White House. The victims included eight crew members and one Secret Service agent. The aircraft and crew were stationed out of Dias Air Force Base. Then we have four Marine pilots, Marine One presidential helicopter pilots who died on April 8th of 2000. Names were not mentioned, all died with 15 others in a crash of a V-22 Osprey near Tucson. Witnesses reported the aircraft burst into flames in mid-flight and then crashed. Then we come to Kathy Ferguson, who was a witness. She died on May 10th of 1994. Kathy Ferguson supposedly committed suicide on May 10th of 1994 when she shot herself in her living room. Kathy's ex-husband, interestingly enough, was Danny Ferguson, who was the Arkansas trooper who said he escorted Paula Jones to Bill Clinton's hotel room. Kathy often told friends and co-workers about how Bill had gotten Danny to bring women to him and stand watch while they had sex. Danny Ferguson was a co-defendant along with Bill Clinton in Paula Corbin Jones' sexual harassment suit, Kathy Ferguson was a cooperating witness for Miss Jones. Oddly, next to Kathy's body were her packed bags as if she was expecting to be going somewhere. Then we have Dawn Garrett, who was a radio host and Al Gore fundraiser, died July 26th of 1995. He was a lawyer and talk show host for KGOAM in San Francisco. Dawn was a campaign finance chairman for Diane Fernstein's run for the Senate and was a friend and fundraiser for Al Gore. According to Garrett's lawyer, Garrett was under investigation for defrauding investors in Garrett's failed sports memorabilia venture. There was a talk of a deal to evade prosecution, but on July 26th, Garrett cancelled an afternoon meeting with his lawyer because he had to meet some people at the San Francisco airport. Three hours later, he was found floating in the bay under the Golden Gate Bridge. Then there was Corporal Eric X. Fox, crewman for Marine One, the presidential helicopter, died March 22nd of 1999, shot in the head, and it was declared a suicide. Next we have Carlos... Gelotti. He was a thermal imaging expert, died April 28th of 2000. Carlos Gelotti, 42, was found dead in his home just outside of Washington, D.C. There was no sign of a break-in or struggle at the firm of infrared technology where the badly decomposed body of Gelotti was found. Gelotti had not been seen for several weeks. Gelotti, a formal imaging analyst hired by the House Government Reform Committee to review the tape of the siege at Waco, Texas, said he determined the FBI fired shots on April 19th of 1993. Interestingly enough, those same shots the FBI has explained that those light bursts on infrared footage as re- are reflections of sun rays or shards of glass or other derbs that littered the scene. Now we come to Judy Gibbs. She was a penthouse model and call girl and died January 3rd of 1986. Judy Gibbs, along with her sister Sharon, appeared in the December 1979 issue of Penthouse and later worked at a bordello in Ford Reese near Mena, Arkansas which also ran a blackmail operation with photos taken of the customers with their girls. According to the Gibbs family, Bill Clinton was a regular customer of Judy and there were photos of him having sex with her that threatened his presidential campaign. While cooperating with law enforcement in a drug investigation, Judy died when her house burned down. No cause for the fire was found and Judy had called the fire department to report the fire, but her body was found on the floor in front of a ground floor window near a door that would have allowed her to escape. In a sworn statement, Clinton bodyguard Barry Spivy related how he had been with the governor when the governor's plane had flown over Judy Gibbs house and Clinton had shown Judy's penthouse photos on the plane and pointed out the house. Then we come to Paula Grober, Clinton's speech interpreter for the death, died December 9th of 1992. She died in a one-car accident with no known witnesses. Her body was thrown 33 feet from the car, indicating a very high speed. A very attractive woman, Paula travelled extensively with Clinton from 1978 up until her death. Clinton, through a spokesperson, called Grober's death quote, a great personal loss, end quote. He also said, quote, Hillary and I extend our sincere sympathy to Paula's family. I had the privilege of working for her over many years, end quote. 
Then we have Staff Sergeant Brian Henley, Marine Sergeant Tim Sabble, Major William Barclay, and Captain Scott Reynolds, who were all Clinton bodyguards that died May 19th of 1993. All four of these men died when their helicopter crashed in the woods near Quantico VA. Reporters were barred from the site, and the head of the fire department responding to the crash described it by saying, Security was tight, with lots of Marines with guns. The Marines seized a videotape made by a firefighter, and all four men had escorted Clinton on his flight to the carrier Roosevelt shortly before their deaths. Then we have Michael Hastings, journalist for Rolling Stone, died June 18th of 2013. Michael Hastings died in a highly suspicious single car accident. He had told friends that he was afraid for his life following stories he had written which were critical of Secretary of State Hillary Clinton. One of the emails leaked during the 2016 Democratic Convention confirmed that Hillary had received Hastings' damning investigative report of the attack on the Benghazi consulate five months before his death. Then we have Stanley Hurd, chairman of the National Chiropractic Healthcare Advisory Committee. And also Stephen Dixon, counsel to Mr. Hurd. Both died September 10th of 1993. Both of them died in a plane crash outside Dulles Airport after their aircraft, rented after Hurd's personal craft developed troubles, crashed while attempting an emergency landing after reporting a fire on board. Now, let's repeat that. They took off in a plane, it developed problems, they got it back to the airport, they rented a new plane, they took off in the new rented plane, and it developed a problem. On the way back to the airport, it crashed. Heard, in addition to serving on Clinton's advisory council, also personally treated Clinton's mother, stepfather, and brother. Then we have John Hillier. He was an NBC and freelance cameraman. He died in 1996. Hillier passed away in a dentist's office from unknown causes, despite being very health conscious and in good physical condition. It was declared a heart attack, was working on an investigation into Mina, and assisted with the circle of power in Clinton Chronicles. Sometime after his passing, his widow recalled her husband saying he felt he could be in danger. Then we have Stanley Huggins, he was partner in a Memphis law firm, died June 23rd of 1994. He was investigating Madison Garanty, reported to have succumbed to viral pneumonia. His 300-page report has never been released, and Stanley had been at a cotton carnival party on a Friday night. He was supposed to escort his wife all week during the seven-day event, but told her he couldn't as something important was going down. He has recently left the law firm in Little Rock, where Hillary Clinton worked and set up a small office in Memphis. On that Friday night, he seemed extremely nervous and about to jump out of his skin. The word circulated throughout the party that he'd been involved in some secretive issue that was under the microscope. Soon after that, he was told by his wife that he'd flown up to any university to give a speech on a Saturday. He checked into the provided dorm room by the university and the employee said that he looked fine. When they called up to his room later in that day, he didn't answer the phone so they went to check on him and found him dead. The death was declared due to viral pneumonia. His wife tried to get the hospital records but they were sealed by Janet Reno under presidential orders of Clinton. Over that weekend, his Memphis office was broken into and the only noticeable thing taken were his files. The 300 page report was never released. Then we have Sandy Hume, who was a journalist, died 2nd of June 1998. On Sunday, February 22nd of 1998, Sandy Hume, the 28-year-old son of journalist Britt Hume, was reportedly found in his Arlington, Virginia home. Aside from the statement that this was an apparent suicide, there remains in place a total media blackout on the story, possibly out of concern that the actual facts will not withstand public scrutiny. Indeed, it was reported in Associated Press that the Arlington police were not responding to any inquiries. Hume was a reporter for the Hill Magazine newspaper about Congress for Congress and had broken a major story in 1996 regarding the friction between House Speaker Newt Greenwich and a faction led by Representative Paxson who announced his resignation just 24 hours after Hume's death. In addition, Sandy Hume had just joined the staff at Fox TV News and was just three weeks into a job that represented the pinnacle of his young career. Oddly enough, aside from echoing the one Associated Press story, the Fox News website has ignored the death of its newest commentator. Sandy already had a reputation for getting the story that nobody else wanted to look at. It is worth noting that his death came hard on the heels of reports that a reporter was about to break a story confirming the White House's use of investigators to dig up dirt on critics. It has recently been confirmed that the man who performed the as-yet-unreleased autopsy is none other than Dr. James C. Byer, who has a record of concealing homicides behind a ruling of suicide. Kenneth Starr's suicidologist, Dr. Alan A. Berman, has waded in again, and as he did in the Foster death, ruled it 100% certain that this is a suicide and can be nothing else. End quote. 
Then we come to Barry Seal, who was a CIA drug pilot and died February 19th of 1986. Now known to have been a gun and drug smuggler for the CIA operating out of the MENA airport, Barry Seal had reportedly kept in contact with Bill Clinton's head of security at the governor's mansion, Raymond Buddy Young, the ex-rodeo clown who is now the number two man at FEMA. Following his fall from CIA grace, Barry was sentenced to live at a Salvation Army housing complex by a judge who also prohibited Barry Seal to have any other guns or to employ any bodyguards. Corruption doesn't become any more obvious than this. Barry was gunned down with a machine gun fire in the parking lot of the Salvation Army housing complex. In violation of the court order, Barry had hired bodyguards who worked a rotation schedule, but the bodyguard who was there when Barry was killed never showed up. That bodyguard, according to video producer Daniel Hopsicker, was a former associate, meaning drug pilot, of Barry's named William Bear Bottoms. Bottoms proud the internet, insisting that there was never any drug running operation at Mena, Kansas. Then we come to the very controversial case of Kevin Ives and Don Henry, the boys on the train tracks. They were witnesses and died on August 23rd of 1987. Initial cause of death was claimed to be the result of passing out on a railroad track in Arkansas after smoking 20 marijuana cigarettes. This ruling was reported by the state medical examiner Falmy Malik and supported by Sh Sheriff Jim Steed, who, whose thorough investigation of the crime scene left one of the boys' foots sitting in the open for two days. In April of 1998, Kevin's body was exhumed and another autopsy was performed. This one by Atlanta medical examiner Dr. Joseph Burton who discovered that Kevin died from a crushed skull prior to being placed on the tracks. Don Henry's body was exhumed and discovered to have been stabbed in the back prior to being placed on the tracks. Governor Bill Clinton excused Falmy Malik's errors saying that Malik was tired and stressed out. Reports indicate that Ives and Henry might have stumbled upon part of the MENA drug operation, specifically a drop site in the area of Baxit and Alexander, Arkansas. The police chief of Alexander, John Brown, acknowledged that he obtained a taped confession from one of the murderers of the two boys, which was suppressed at the request of the FBI. Jean Duffy headed up Arkansas' 7th District Drug Force in 1990. She was never allowed to conduct a thorough investigation of drug running in MENA or any possible connection to the train deaths. Her task force and a federal grand jury were shut down after they started examining corruption involving public officials. Dan Harmon was a local government official, the prosecuting attorney for Salem, Grant and Hot Springs counties in 1979 and 1980 and then again from 1991 through to 1996. He was convicted in June of 1997 on drug racketeering and extortion charges and has serving eight years in prison. In January of 1991, long before his drug offences became public knowledge, Harmon convinced a judge to subpoena evidence obtained by Gene Duffy's task force, evidence gathered against him and other public officials. Miss Duffy refused to honour the subpoena fearing for the lives of witnesses, many of whom did turn up dead, and fled the state when a warrant was issued for her arrest. Then we come to Gregory Collins, who was a witness to the above train deaths. Died in January of 1989. Greg had information on the Ives Henry deaths. He died from a gunshot blast to the face, and it was declared a suicide. Then there was Keith Coney, witness to the train deaths. Died May of 1988. Keith had information on the Ives Henry deaths. Died in a motorcycle accident in July 1988 while being chased in a, by a car. It was ruled a traffic accident. Then there was Jordan Kittleson, witness to the train deaths, died June 1990. Kittleson had information on the Ives and Henry deaths. He was found shot to death in, front of, in the front seat of his pickup truck. Then we have Keith McCaskill, he witnessed to the train deaths, died November 10th of 1988. Keith had information on the mean of drug running and the Henry Ives murders. He was stabbed 113 times. He told his family someone was out to kill him and told them goodbye. Then we have James Dewey Milam, witness to the MENA drug operation and the Henry Ives murders, died in 1989. Milam was decapitated. Clinton's notorious state medical examiner, Falmy Malik, initially ruled the death to an ulcer, claiming that the victim's small dog had eaten the head, which was later recovered from a trash bin several blocks away. Jeff Rhodes, witnessed in the train deaths, died April 1989. Jeff had information on the deaths of Ive, Henry and McCaskill. His burned body was found in a trash dump. He died of a gunshot wound to the head and there was some body mutilation, specifically that his hands and feet had been partially sawn off, leading to the speculation that he was tortured prior to being killed. The body was then burned. 
We then have Richard Winters, suspects in the deaths of Ives and Henry, died July of 1989. Winters offered to cooperate. He was killed by a shotgun blast to the face during a robbery, which was subsequently proven to be a setup. Dan Harmon, the prosecutor who Winters reportedly made the offer to, was implicated in the Kevin slash Ives death and was jailed for running his office as a criminal enterprise to extort narcotics and cash, proof that elements of Arkansas law enforcement were corrupted by drugs during Bill Clinton's tenure as governor. 